Well, in exactly 10 months from today, if nothing changes, Nigerians will elect their new president. As parents have been announcing their ambitions and have come forward to express their interest and go as far as picking up the nomination forms. There are at least 17 presidential aspirants in the opposition party, the PDP, where discussions of choosing a consensus candidate have broken down. In the APC, there are at least 15 aspirants vying to be president with more waiting to announce their ambitions. Recently, a former president also subtly threw his heart in the ring and sought the support of incumbent before announcing his ambition. How do we differentiate between frontrunners and pretenders? What determines a frontrunner and a pretender? Power, position, money or social clout? That's our conversation today on VSA. Welcome, I'm Sulaiman. As the race for the party's tickets for the 2023 election in Niger hots up, as parents have picked up nomination forms. Just in case you're following up, uh, in a staggering declaration by the ruling party, the presidential nomination form was put up for sale at 100 million naira. That's a 263% increase in what it was in 2014 when President Buhari picked the ticket. Uh, so the APC nomination form was sold for 27.5 million naira in 2014. Then the president had difficulty in purchasing the form, as he said. Now, the PDP also sold its form for 12 million naira in 2019 and is selling for 40 million naira ahead of the 2023 election in what's uh, a 233% increase in comparison. Nigerians have criticized both parties for these moves and are already doubting their intentions for the ordinary local. Some parties stalwarts have said it's a move to separate the serious from the fake and the front runners from the pretenders. So choice and model of party primaries is still discussed with the uh, two former parties leaning towards an indirect primary election. This, political experts have also said, is a means to test popularity in the party and test the strength of these aspirants. There are so many names, but who's proven ready for the race? Now, Jeremy. Live in the studio is Adeni Kunu. He's a public affairs analyst and a journalist. And Chukuma Okenwa, executive director, lead network. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to VSA. Let's start with you, Chukuma. I'm sure you've been following developments. First, uh, just give us your overview of, of what it's been like as Nigerians look forward to the big year 2023. Okay, uh, I think uh, one very impressive thing about the race come 2023 is the fact we're beginning to have many aspirants on the major platforms demonstrating their interest uh, to serve at the Nigeria top job. And I think uh, it is healthy for uh, democracy. But on the other side of the development is a very worrisome one, uh, which has to do with um, the rising costs of the nomination form. And uh, that is not impressive at all. Uh, because, of course, we are just talking about only nomination and this in a democracy, people have the right to aspire, people have the right, you know, to, to go for elections. And when you raise the price so high, what you have just done is to disenfranchise some Nigerians from actually aspiring. And I want to differ from that thought that uh, be raising the cost of the form, we actually be the elastic to separate the pretenders. Uh, from the foreigners, uh, the front runners, uh, that doesn't really add up considering that in the APC, for instance, this is happening under the purview of the national leader of the party at the moment, who is also the president, who's at his own time claimed that he could not afford uh, the cost of the form. So one wonders if you were able to like still become the president despite not being able to afford that why raise that the you know in, you know you know the mm. banner in terms of the cost of the form this is all about service mm. 
It's so not I, a I'll business. I'll come back to you. I just wanted to get the overview. I'll come back to you so that we can actually dig in deep. Let me come back to the studio where uh, Adini Kuno is with me. Now, you know, looking at developments, uh, you know, as Nigerians look towards that big moment, uh, you know, holistically speaking, if we can actually do this in a minute, what's your overview or what's your reading of what's uh, happening at the moment? I think that um, we can't circumscribe a party's right to determine the fees for our forms. But if we place in context the sold ideologies and the sold identities of the party to the Nigerian people, uh, there is some kind of headbutt talking about the idea that the party stands for and, of course, the cost that we found. Uh, I have personally spoken to the National Publicity, uh, Publicity Secretary, uh, Mr. Felix Mocha, and, you know, the excuse he also gave included the fact that uh, there is always an expectation of litigations after major elections, and the party needs to have enough in our accounts to be able to actually offset legal fees. Well, that also didn't sit well with me as much as we can actually accommodate it to an extent. But don't forget that when you say a party is progressive, it is progressive because it believes that more people should come on the wagon of success of democracy. A party is said to be progressive when it believes that its ideologies actually accommodate contemporary positives. But in the light of that, a party also that signed into law May 31, 2018, the Not Too Young to Run Bill to an Act, is also a party that has created the impression about allowing more people to participate in a democratic process. So pegging your major presidential nomination and expression of interest from about 100 million seems to be at odds with what you posited earlier. Let me come to you, uh, Chukuma. You know, we have a huge number of names uh, already vying for these two parties, from these two parties. And uh, when is it likely to start seeing some candidates dropping out? Uh, well, eventually, uh, I know that uh, ahead of the primaries, uh, like uh, we, we got uh, a tip of the iceberg with what happened and uh, ahead of the APC National Convention. Uh, Wills, it is obvious that there are some persons uh, are currently masquerading as uh, aspirants who would eventually be the one that um, uh, the major interest in the party will want to seek to achieve a consensus. Uh, more or less like people begin to step down for uh, some others ahead of the, the, the primary elections. And uh, we just have uh, just a few weeks to the primary elections of the major political parties in Nigeria. And interestingly, uh, maybe two weeks to time, one week to time, even uh, three days and a day to time, you begin to see uh, like some person step down for others. And with that, Nigerians can actually get a clearer picture of the major contenders. But beyond that, uh, just mere declaration of interest. One thing is obvious. For any party, for any, uh, for, for, for any presidential aspirant to constitute a major presidential can, uh, aspirant, you have to look at the goodwill, the social capital of that particular candidate. And uh, one don't need to be told that, of course, as long as APC is consigned, uh, the choice is between uh, uh, Etinibu, uh, Osip Banjo, and, of course, Amechi. And when you look at the PDP, you have the likes of uh, uh, P2B, uh, Pius IM, Atiku, Bukola Saraki, and some of these uh, guys that have built their, their, their portfolio politically and have also created the social capital and been able to build relationship across board. Because you are talking about impressing this is your political zones, not just your own state. Hmm. Okay, let's come to you, uh, uh, Ni. You know, there are some key uh, concerns by Nigerians uh, asking, how do you know? Uh, because uh, um, some journalists have been trying to gauge how you can recognize who a pretender is mm. and who a contender is. Mm. And going by what Chukuma has also analyzed, it would mean that uh, if uh, they had gone by such readings by the political parties, uh, President Buhari would have been turned uh, a pretender in 2014 because mm -hmm. he couldn't afford to deform. So is it, or is it on how deep your pocket is? Well, I think as that explained by the by the APC. Quite frankly, we are not civilized out of money politics yet, uh, Solai, and that is a fact that many armchair critics can argue against. But that essentially remains a fact. What are the fundamentals of money politics? 
you have to gauge first what the citizen, the average citizen of the country lives on every day, less than a dollar. Even if nobody wants to talk about it, it's a fact of the matter. So you have to look at what the inflation rate is right now. It's double digits. You have to look at how many percentage of the population is out of jobs. So that means that in the usual manner of those that are becoming money politics is still one big thing. But again, we can experience a tsunami. We're talking about a country that has an approximate 147 million youth. And you never can tell what reconscientization the youth could experience between now and December of this year that will shape their opinions regarding the candidates they eventually settle for. It therefore means that nothing is cast in stone. Of course, we're talking about the vice president as a contender. Well, we know that every vice president in Nigeria, Dito or Shivaju, has always been a spare tire. And your spare tire may not be used for up to one year, if at all you're lucky to avoid the potholes or the damage of the tires. And even if the tires are damaged, you may want to patch the one that is there and not use the spare. So I'm just saying here, Sulai, hmm. that if you talk about those that are contending, if you check it again now, there is a chunk that has been taken off Tinubu. Why? Or Shibajo is in the race. If you're talking about an Amechi, what is the good deal of Amechi outside the South-South geopolitical zone? So the truth is, even Bola Tinubu understands that his market may not sell beyond select states of the Southwest, may not sell in the Southeast, may not be countenanced in the South-South, may not be looked at in the North Central. But people do not also understand the North Central part of the country has always determined to a great extent where the vote swings because there is always a block coming from that region. Then you're talking about people in their 60s, people over 70s. What about a Yaya Bello? Are you going to circumscribe his rights to participate in the forthcoming election? How about the people that he has appealed to from the North Central to other parts of the North? So you cannot discount the capacities of anybody and the grand work that is already going on for many people. So let's come to the PDP, for instance. We're talking about a Peter Obi. Many people have been writing about Peter Obi. We've not seen so many pictures about the thing they said he did in Anambra. Well, we're talking about the fact that he saved certain th amount of money. No problem about it. Let's look at Ati Kwabubaka. He's coming back and forth, but that's another problem. A new development, as announced by the Northern Elders Forum, is also another thing of concern. Professor Angu Abdullah had said that the consensus candidate would be between the governor of Bochi State and, of course, Bukola Saraki. Tambuala said no. Some other people have said no to it. So you find out that everybody is still at par, especially at this level that everyone is still an aspirant. So maybe in the common way, so talking about the primaries of the PDP coming up May 28th and 29th, the primary of the APC coming up May 30 and 31, so you never can tell what happens. So everybody is still shoulders equal as far as this is concerned. That's where I come to you, Chukuma. Uh, you know, uh, he said everyone is still an aspirant. And there are lots of talks about zoning, which he also touched on a little bit, and the APC looks bound to follow that direction. Now, the PDP looks to have thrown the gates open. What difference will this stand to make uh, in the grand scheme of events uh, as we move towards uh, that big year? Okay, like uh, as regards to, uh, let me first uh, weigh in uh, slightly Go ahead. Uh, with what my co-analyst uh, uh, has to say, uh, that at the moment, everyone uh, remains uh, on same uh, pedestrian. Well, uh, that that uh, makes some logical sense uh, if we are to be in a center line where people actually uh, want to run to contend, they want to like really stand out, you know, not a situation of like someone is even sponsored at the first instance to come pretend and then at the end of the day becomes a basis for negotiation. We know the realities. Even when you look at the newspapers, there are those that make the news. Some others, like even to date, like the, the person that is out there in the market, know that there are those that are actually declared. I mean, declaration amongst the declaration. Some persons declared and, you know, without really hearing one or two things about them once in a while, you can't really associate that these ones are in the race. But of course, when you talk about the Jagaban, it's all over the place. Osibanjo also is someone that um, we can't, uh, uh, you know, you know, look at, uh, overlook his capacity in terms of what he's doing. And and then also like in in terms of uh, P2B, one thing that is very significant. Yes, some critics has come up, show us what you did and stuff like that. P2B number one, 
renovated all of the schools, 5,000 schools in Anambra, equipping all of them with computers. That's what he did in terms of education. In terms of health, built some new hospitals. And he's someone that, that really never made like too much of noise, invested critically into human capital development, as well as stabilized the state in terms of economy. For someone to come, offset the bills of a state, pay off all of the debt, build capital base for the state. I mean, you've made that state uh, you know, you know, you know, uh, uh, sustainable. What was just needed is for the next man coming on board to build on the gains of the administration, uh, which unfortunately, uh, we didn't see Obia not do that. And one thing also, one of the things we must realize is that Executing projects, and not, you know, it's not just enough to assess and to clap for someone, because if you send someone to do, maybe to buy something for you, and you give the person 100,000, and he buys something of 40,000, and you keep clapping without actually interrogating the process, then you, have not, you are not going to have anything close to accountability. And we know that those in government, most of the time, they try to look for projects to justify the theft. Because for someone that, that was handed over by a six billion to further O, in, in the tune of over 100 billion in that particular state, and all you just have to justify is an airport and maybe a township stadium, I think it is not good enough looking at the gains of the previous administration. And having said that now, I think uh, uh, PDP uh, actually trying to lie with all of the calculations and permutations and throwing the whole thing open. We know that as long as PDP is concerned, uh, the Saudis has actually paid their dues uh, you may not say that uh, about APC, uh, because when you even look at the merger, uh, the, the Igbos had a little to contribute. When you look at the block of votes to the APC, so one can argue that uh, Igbos have not paid their dues in terms of APC. But even right from the formation, the formation of PDP, and in terms of the voting as well, the South East has critically demonstrated commitment to that party. And one would expect that they should zone the presidency, not just to the South, but also to the southeast, not to the north, because at the moment, the north only have five PDP states. So how are you going to use that to negotiate for the southern Nigeria that is largely more of PDP? So if the APC is being gracious enough to tilt a bit towards the south, southern part of the country, why won't the PDP toward the same part and specifically to the southeast? Chukuma, I'll come to you. I'll come back so that we can stretch this. Because now you've started a new, you open up a new vista, which uh, I want me to uh, latch onto. And it has to do with the politics of uh, being tested and even maybe trusted by talking about some of the key things some of these people have done. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, another uh, aspirant mm -hmm. is Nigeria's Labour Minister. Chris Ingege, a medical doctor, mm. and uh, and listening to uh, Chukuma reel out some of the key things uh, Peter Obi did while he was governor of Anambra City in southeast of Nigeria. Mm. Uh, the labor minister, some have said, uh, asked questions that Nigerian universities are still on strike, and uh, he's not been able to actually, uh, you know, get that conversation go past where it is at the moment. Uh, where does it fall into in this categorization of Nigerians looking at pretenders and contenders? Well, I think that if we use, look at the words denotatively, um, it may be okay for us to remove pretenders, except of course if we want to go the connotative way of doing a dissection of these words. Um, Ngige really feels that the constitution gives them the room to contest to the vote and the D protocol. D does it, it? Oh, most definitely. Section 4, Section 7, Section 77, this provides room for him to associate, to vote and be voted for, to belong anywhere. So that's guaranteed. But see, politics is about the impact we've made in the lives of people. It's hiatus as a former governor of Anambra State before he was thrown out of office. And don't forget the same Peter B eventually had to, you know, do a lot of things after he left office. But basically, when he was governor of Anambra, for the brief period he stayed, people said, yes, he did well. But nobody takes advantage of a seat through on due process. So that's history. So let's come to the serial contending for the governorship after he was left out of office, which never worked for him. It never materialized for him. So let's also look at that. So I believe very strongly first that if we look at the backwater of, of Anambra, if the people had given him 
their vote. He would have said, most definitely, they believe he has the capacity to take them out of the trouble that characterize geographical spaces called states or countries. But moving away from that, we'll now talk about his acceptance as a minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Apart from the ongoing strike, Ngige had once said, and I quote, Nigeria has more than enough doctors that we're exporting. Now, when he was quoted to have said that, he said they took him out of context. Then perhaps I felt maybe his spiritual representative made mention of that thing that he said, forgetting that at times when you say things on television, such as where those things seem to be permanent when people quote you. That is one part. Then what has been the relationship of Chris Ngige, even with the, the, the Nigeria Social Insurance Trust Fund? For many people who do not understand that, and even that aspect of the Nigeria Data Development Committee, we're just talking about education and bringing to other areas, critical federal government structures. I have done my internal findings, and many of the things said about Ngige, they are unsavory regarding how you're supposed to approve certain things with the board present, you're supposed to constitute a board, but lots of things have not happened because Ngige actually has been preventing it from happening. I did my findings, and I have my sources. So I'm saying this is an international platform that I am. I cannot come here and be careless with words. I have my findings done, tidied up here regarding that. So when you have a man who perhaps has not managed federal government agencies well, well, so I may agree with you that he's a pretender. Because as a contender, you tidy up loose ends, even if we know that there is no candidate that has 100% thumbs up. We are humans. Perfection is the exclusive preserve of the gods. And Chukuma, you know, you, you move this towards uh, the, I, I, I like the fact that you, you, you're chuckling and you put a smile on your face. That's the thing we have here on the square. So now, uh, there's another man, another man. Now, I, I want to start looking towards where you, you, you left off, Nigeria's southeast. And Nigeria has been blessed to have uh, uh, a man as Senate President Pius Ayim from the backwaters of the southeast, specifically in Ebony State. Uh, would you, how would you, you know, rate uh, Pius Ayim, you know, putting him as a contender, pretender, as we analyze some of the key things as you've done with uh, former Governor Peter Obi? Yeah, certainly. Uh, he is a, a top con a contender as long as the race is consigned. Uh, Pio Sataim is one that is well respected by the stakeholders across the southeast, someone that uh, has risen to the position of uh, the Senate president. Uh, that's not a mean feat. And uh, one like that, that has also been around power, uh, secretary to the government of the federation, and then with all the capacity he has reflected across board. Judging even from his uh, consultative capacity, the much he's been able to do appeasing uh, uh, the relevant stakeholders across board, I would judge him a top contender as long as this race is concerned. So quickly, uh, now we're still very much around the uh, south now. Let's stretch it before I come back to the studios uh, to join uh, uh, Ni. Um, the governor, serving governor of Ebony State is also uh, in the race. Uh, he's also declared saying that he had that conversation with President Buhari. Um, let us in on what you think uh, some people in Nigeria Southeast are thinking of uh, Governor Dave Umahi. Well, uh, earnestly, as long as uh, Dave Umahi is concerned, um, it's largely perceived that uh, he's a pretender. He's actually not contending as long as the race is concerned. Uh, the reason is that his leave uh, is risen uh, for jettison. Uh, he's uh, the party on, upon which platform he took over power, and that is the PDP, was not cogent enough. And uh, one of the things also we've seen play out in Nigeria politics is if you cannot be trusted from where you are coming from, then certainly where you are going to, <laughs> they would also have that level of trust in you, because there's also a possibility that if he's made the president under APC, tomorrow he could come back to PDP and that's a loss of the mandate. Because certainly now, PDP has just switched, I mean, uh, 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 instead of just switched effortlessly from a PDP state to an APC state. And you are talking about the gains of over 16 years. One man just by the switch of interest 
was able to create that switch. So don't expect the political gladiators to trust him. Now let's um, come to you, uh, uh, Ni, and you know, you said something about not central of yes, Nigeria, yes. which is very, very key. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at uh, the political journey of Nigeria so far, it would seem as if the not central has not produced a president mm -hmm. yet. Uh, and uh, a, a young uh, Nigerian who, who is uh, uh, a seventh governor uh, of a North Central state, Yahya Bello, is also in the race. Mm -hmm. um, I think that people feel that the political gladiators, we give them that name, except of course we want to go and do the death fight in a circus. I, I, I was in, going to in, ask, in, but how did we arrive at that? Because well, I, see, I see journalists it, put, yeah. making them look like fighters and they leave as fighters. Uh, but quite frankly, politics is battle. Look at what happened in France, Le Pen and Macron before the emergence of Macron. The first time in 20 years getting the second term. So let's come back to what we're talking about, Sulai. I, I have to say that Many people are not looking in that direction. And there are times when you don't look in certain direction, some things happen. Somebody once told me that if you aim for the stars and you get the moon, you're lucky. Or you aim for the moon and get the stars, you're lucky. A lot of people are not looking in that direction because we've been talking about zoning, zoning, zoning. Well, why they said that? Because we mentioned your ability is that. Abdullah Adamu, who is the current national chairman of the APC, is from the North Central State of Nasrallah State. And Yahya Bello is from the North Central State of Kogi. But we know that the North Central has not produced the president detail the northeastern part of the country. If we checked our return to democracy since 1999, you find that the South South has had five years. The Yoruba race, as it were, the Southwest had had well over eight. Then you're talking about the Northwest that has had arguably maybe about 13 or 15, but some other places are cut it down to eight. Yaradwa, now, three, Mr. Muhammad Ibuari has done, he will do eight. Seven plus three, ten, talking about next year, he would have done 11. The, the people in the Southwest have also done some good numbers. So people could just go into that election. For instance, there are lots of work going beneath, because don't forget that emergence means you must have done a lot of work with your grassroots, with your delegates to that particular primary, because the delegates are the ones that will vote there. It's not a general election. So what if, for instance, a Yaya Bello has been able to do some other groundwork that make him gather all the youth there? Uh, because politics are always full of surprises. So, so, so it's a what if that we must consider. What, what if that happens? If eventually happens, that simply means we are left with whoever is going to be at the opposing party. That is the reality of it. And don't forget, there is something we have to understand here. The North Central will always align with their own first. So that means if somebody from the North Central, don't forget what total are six states in the North Central part of the country. That is some good numbers. Nasarawa is there. Abuja, the FCT is there. Obviously, Kogi is there. We have a lot. We have six. So if, for instance, the Northeast is divided because of those that will emerge from that region, and the Northwest is divided, and some other people who are from the Southwest feel Maybe they are tied with some people that have held the Southwest bound for many years and decide that there are Yoruba people in Kogi State. Let's vote with them. What if the South South people feel we don't want Peter Obi, we'd rather go North Central? That is permutation in politics. So the people who subject it to proper sciences will say there's a probability of capturing this. They'll just tell you if we get 30% from here, 10% from this, we'll get block food from here before you know we're making it happen. And no matter what anybody cries, well, that is just a person's cry because we have to go ahead. Look at what happens in the last elections that resulted in Oyetola's emergence as the governor of Ekiti State. It went into a runoff. Uh, Oshun. Oshun Oshun State. State. Sergio Oshun State. It went into a runoff. So the SDP held the aces and the spades. So they called Omishori, Omishori, come here. And Omishori became the man of the moment, and they had to have some serious conversations with the person. Don't forget two-thirds in 25 states out of 36, two-thirds majority. So if we look at somebody getting 23, 25, there will always be some way the person, will, and that is why I'm saying that for the Southeast, let us go back to the Southeast, because there are lots of discussions around the Southeast. Don't forget there are also Igbo people in, in, in Kogi State. For many people who don't do, there are lots of Bene people in Kogi State. The ethnic closeness, the linguistic affinity with Kogi, actually aligns itself with a lot of Southeast states. Kogi is bordered by 10 states. And don't forget, Yahya Bene looks to me like 
the youngest from that region, even if we have an Okunu from the southwest, from Lagos Island, there's another young man who is from uh, Delta State that are also as young as him. But we're talking about a governor that actually has experienced lots of things that perhaps has given him an insider knowledge of how to do his permutation. So going back to the southeast, Peter B, for instance, by all standards, has the qualities you'd expect somebody to replicate across Nigeria. But what is the bargaining chip of Peter Obi? I think I'll have to stop you. Oh, we'll, my goodness. We'll, we'll, no, no, we'll come back. Okay, so we'll talk about the bargaining chips of, of, of Peter Obi. Yes, yes, please. But again, before we go on the break, so listening to your analysis, where do you put uh, Governor Yaya Bello? Well, I think that even if he doesn't get the major ticket, <laughs> somebody could look right and left and say, let's have him as a VP with the way it's going. Because I just think... Because people are looking at those no names. So, I'm so, at so those... contender, pretender, where does it fall? He's a contender, for goodness sake. Okay, we'll take a moment. When we come back, we'll dig in deep here on the square. Join us again. Well, if you just joined us, you're walking, you're watching Village Square Africa here on New Central Television, broadcasting live to 54 African countries and beyond. Now, we're looking at uh, developments in Nigeria, politically speaking, as the country prepares for the next big election in 2023. And uh, the All Progressives Congress, which is the ruling party, is still partly waiting for the president. That's President Muhammad Buhari to announce his choice, as that will also determine who is a contender or a pretender. Now, former Vice President, good luck, Jonathan, is believed, yes, believed to be in the race to become Nigeria's next president. But he's seeking the support of President Muhammad Buhari, who is his friend. With about 10 months to go before the presidential election, new parties are also emerging. There's a lot to unpack from these developments. Still with me, live in the studios, at Dini Yukunu and Chukuma Okawa. So uh, uh, before the break, uh, uh, Chukuma, I will, I will need to start with you before I go back to uh, 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 Kuno to talk more about uh, the Southeast. Now, do you think the party's current approaches now, spe specifically speaking, the two big parties, will spark enough reactions from the public and electorates by what you've seen so far? Yeah, yeah, and honestly, like, um, realistically, from what I see, it doesn't see many of the uh, two major political parties is tilting uh, towards the southeast. And uh, we are not happy about that. And uh, it's one also that um, is going to stir up uh, the current agitations, the perceptions of marginalization, because how would one explain it that from 1966 to date, uh, and Igbo man has neither been the president nor the vice president of this great country. So how will Nigeria explain that to uh, Igbos that they are still part of this great nation? And let me say something that is very important and also many persons have actually asked, uh, will it really be possible for the two major political parties you know, to give their ticket to, uh, to Igbos? But we saw that play out in, of course, in, 2000 and, uh, in 1999, uh, we are like the two top contenders was Obasanjo under the platform of PDP. And of course, we have Ulufa Lae uh, under the, the platform of AD and of course, um, APP, right? So that mm -hmm. has played out in time past. And we know that 1999 election, it was very obvious that 
if we don't assuage the Southwest, based on what happened in 1993 with respect to uh, uh, the council election of Abiola, you know, it, that will spell like doom for the nation. So coming to a time like this also, we saw like the yeah, Jonathan ever even uh, got close to the seat of power because of the agitations in Niger Delta. We've seen agitations there in the south uh, southeast that nobody's trying to look at uh, the direction of the southeast to address like these core challenges. If we truly want the southeast to feel part of being the part of this great nation, then we must do the needful as a nation to show the southeast that they are part of the nation. And interestingly, we have one, two, three, four of the candidates that have demonstrated interest that we have the capacity to deliver good governance to the good people of Nigeria. Well, Chukuma, and uh, you know, uh, uh, there have been lots of issues on internal democracy in the past. Uh, have you seen enough of these in, in recent times in any of the parties? Honestly, the issue of internal democracy is one that uh, needs to be discussed and we need to begin to tackle it because it's even almost like um, a norm now for you to have either a governor or a president uh, like anoint a candidate. I mean, this, this should not be happening in our democracy at this particular phase. It is, you know, we must give that due regard to allow the process to throw up the best form of candidates, not a situation where we we'll always be looking out for like to say like what happened recently in a boy state where it's even on the papers that he just anointed, you know, the speaker as his successor. And even there, like in, in ABC now, people are looking at the body language of Mr. President to know who is going to anoint. The question is, before he became president, who anointed him? Of course, APC was not in charge at that particular point. They allowed the process, internal democracy, to throw him up. So one of the very disappointing things that we see under the current administration judging by what has happened in the form, judging also like how internal democracy and even uh, uh, direct primaries gave rise to his emergence, despite not having all of the money. Why wouldn't someone like this ensure and insist on internal democracy as a way to throw up the best candidates and ensure that people that don't have all of the money but have the heart to serve Nigeria are naturally thrown up through the political processes to serve the nation? Okay, uh, Chukuma, we'll come back to you so that we can talk more about the campaigns uh, and talk more on uh, what uh, uh, the crux of the matter of campaigns uh, should be. I will come to you, Kuno, and it has yeah. to do with where we left off, uh, talking about the, yes, <laughs> the bargaining chips of uh, yeah, uh, uh, th this candidate from Nigeria's Southeast. Okay, let me say that between 1970 and now, uh, the Southeast has had the privilege of producing the vice president the person of Alex Ifani Chukwu Ekwene, who passed, um, I think that should be 2017 or so, uh, between 1979 and 1983. Having said that, let us look at the Southeast, the peculiarity of the Southeast as a region. Um, if you studied Igbo history very well, you'd find out that they're a very Republican people by nature. And that actually had been before contemporary times when we have democratic pattern of political leadership. If you also check the Igbo people, I do not think any region in the country has as much autonomous community as the Igbo people. I have gone to every southeastern part of the country. I didn't pass through. I have gone to. I have slept there. You know, one or two other things have happened. Mm. It therefore means that to a great extent, I have come to understand the nature of the Igbo man. The Igbo man carries his chill with him anywhere he goes and believes I'm fearless I can succeed so far I have the abilities. But you see, the Igbo man in all of its brilliance and the Igbo woman in all of her glories still has not done a proper study of contextual situation in contemporary politics. And that is why they don't take cognizance of bargaining ship one and preceding that is aligning as a block. Let's look at Abga, for instance. Abga is unarguably the party of the Igbo people. Now, I had thought that for a multi-ethnic country as Nigeria, the entire Igbo race would have embraced Abga and used Abga as a bargaining ship to ascend to power. But you see, I think that many of their political scientists still need to go back to a drawing board that they have refused to visit and see 
how that region can be united and hold that which belongs to the region. I know one of the things that I've also seen that may be difficult, not so much about perception of marginalization, but of course, how do or how does the Igbo man perceive another Igbo man, for instance? Now, um, this former warlord, Udume Gojuku, came back after he was granted pardon by Shagari from Cordova, where he had been for many years after he left, you know, owing to the civil war. He came and wanted to go to the National Assembly. Sir, nobody voted him to go there and represent his people. You have to ask me why the Southeast did not vote for a former warlord that led an entire region into a war, believing for a just cause according to him. That is something that many people don't want us to talk about, but we have to talk about it. You could hate me, you could deride me, but that is a fact of political history. So that would have been one bargaining chip that people will perceive and say, indeed, that's it. Let's go to another near recent bargaining chip. The people that were closest to Jonathan from the South-South were the Igbos when he was there. Did the Igbos form a united front with Jonathan such that he felt these are the things we must do with this region after it? And if you also look at it, what was the outcome of that election? Because perception is what we can factor. Mm -hmm. But reality is another thing. That region gave the president 5%. According to the National Population Center's records, the northern part of the country did not experience the vote of the Igbos, particularly Buhari, even if the president did not speak honorably by saying, we shouldn't expect the region that gave him 5% of their votes to, exp to enjoy anything. That, you, that, is, that is on presidential in terms uh, of... And some say undemocratic. Undemocratic as well. Because immediately you emerge, you are the president of all. But that is an aside conversation. The core of it is the Igbo man must understand that over time, it has not created that perception for people. There is a perception of marginalization also. But what is the perception in the mind of others of the Igbo man? Sorry again, this, this bagging you're talking about, yes, I, I, is it similar to what we saw with the AD and the ACN? Most definitely. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, let's look at this. Before you come to the Southwest, if you travel yeah. by road, you'd have crossed South, South, and South East before you come to the Southwest. You have to ask yourself the question. Why is it that the heavy weight of the Northwest and the Northeast, particularly the Northwest, because if you're talking about the original seven Hausa states, they're predominantly the Northwest, how they left the Northwest and came down south to the West to meet a man. It is simply because out of the six states of the entire Southwest at some point, five belong to a party perceived to be led by Ashewajubola Abeng Tinubu, and don't forget that even before that particular agreement came up that there should be an ACN, that same party took its resources and resilience and took some seats at the National Assembly of the North here and there. But Abga did not achieve that. Other regional parties did not achieve that. So there was this feeling, perception again, mm. by the people of the North, that we perceive that if we don't align with this party, it seems to be coming at us as a bulwark that can obviously take over certain things because they're beginning to see this party in the Southwest as a major force to reckon with. And before you knew it, alliance had to be formed. So I think that you must understand that contemporary politics considers bargaining chip, understanding of the fundamentals. You have to understand how you, social capital is very key. What is the social capital of Peter B outside of the Southeast? What is the social capital of Peter B in the South South region? Only day before yesterday or yesterday, a wiki was saying, as the governor, of disrespectfully, the River State. yes, that people know that Peter B can. You know, you, it, it's hurtful, it's painful, it's disrespectful. But wiki perhaps understands what I'm saying here, that the weight you need to have outside of your region. Let's look at it again, Sola. I'm sorry because we have another guest with us. No, no, no. If, we'll if, if, if we'll, if we'll you, come back to uh, Chukuma. If you look at this. I want Chukuma to react to this yeah, because uh, if you, if you look at Chukuma this. has a thin, uh, no, big understanding on, on South East, uh, East politics. It, it's beautiful. If you look at this again, many people have been talking about other candidates and this candidate are not from there. Let's look at Saraki. Let's look at Stambua. I hear the news and conversation about these people, even Atiku from regions that are not theirs. 
But the, the, the consensus and support for P2B is coming more from the southeast. And I was expecting that the ethnically closed people to the southeast who are the south southerners will be speaking loud and clear about the support for him. I was also thinking that because of the many investments that the Igbo people have made in the southwest, especially Lagos, there should be serious conversation about that so that these people have lived with us over the years. If they take Igbo man's tax out of Lagos, we'll feel it here. I'm from Lagos. So I'm just saying that there are lots of things that the Igbo nation, even in the diaspora, must go back to and get the drawing board set clean, set clear, new mappings, new strategy, so that they can have a bargaining chip, thus changing perception. Mm. of them from outside. And quickly, this is uh, where we come to you, Chukuma. And, uh, and I'm quite sure you have a, a whole lot to share with us on uh, some of the key things uh, and Adeni Kunu has uh, said about uh, the Southeast politics. Uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, let me appreciate him for his analysis. And uh, but then one thing also I have to say, uh, just like when you talk about the water system, if you are to let it all to favor, uh, maybe in terms of education, uh, we know that uh, it's going to be really like a tough tax uh, for the North to gain admission in uni unity schools or even in the federal universities. You know, even the, he also referenced about the Fed Federal Character Commission. We know some of those things are in place to ensure equity, to ensure inclusion. And uh, having said that, uh, the South South, as I know, wouldn't have ever, you know, uh, 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 you know, ascended to that top position of the top job in the nation, if not for that of compromise. And um, we know also that uh, in terms of these two major political parties, yes, you referenced Ab Ab Abga Abga, yes, as, as an Igbo party. The interesting thing at the moment is that in, in, in the Southeast, it's more of PDP and APC than, of course, Abga, because at the moment we have two PDP states, two APC states, and of course one APTA. That should be negotiation tools, because in those parties, the question should be that, oh, since we've uh, attended to this region, we've had like Europe go, we've had the uh, outsiders go. The question is, is there one Igbo person in the APC? Is there one Igbo person in the PDP? And if that is the case, don't forget that during the election, who people we vote for is not just a P2B. It's all about voting for the party. So what is just expected is that those ones who are the stakeholders from the north should be able to pull strings for him and garner the votes, the block of votes from their states, from their region. That is what is expected. That is politics. But the situation where you just want to judge it up, once the person is popular and can win his vote in his region, it is good enough. But beyond that, the interesting thing also we must need to know is that the new generation of young Nigerians are very much in love with B2B. We know that several weeks even before he declared, there was that call, you know, demanding for a B2B. And B2B several won the best governor under Honorable Sancho. You know, that PDP president, he was on the up there himself as a PDP, uh, you know, B2B. But because of his sterling performance, he was able to like, you know, you you know, end that record. So I am thinking he's been able to do, do enough and he has demonstrated hope, he's demonstrated commitment to young Nigerians who are in love with him. And I think PDP can actually tap into that vote to, you know, to, you know into that, that goodwill to see that they sell the candidacy of a P2B. And Chukuma, before I, uh, we, now we're closing, winding down, we haven't actually said anything about uh, Atiku Abubakar. I'll bring that to Kunu. But again, is it safe to say uh, Peter Obi's move from Abga to the PDP actually put a nail, you know, to the spread of that political party in Nigeria Southeast? And as we would have expected him to expand the horizon of that party because, of course, that party had potentials. Uh, we even saw that, um, I think that was in, in 2015, where we had the likes of uh, Labaram Mark, you know, tr trying to aspire for, on that platform for, you know, the president of the country. You know, so anything good 
could have happened with that party. Uh, after all, like some other parties, uh, political parties we've seen in time past, uh, you know, started as a regional interest. Mm -hmm. So he should have been able to advance that. But perhaps if felt PDP was okay, and that should be a more reason why, you know, uh, co-nationalists from other regions should be able to consider him as someone that has a steep national interest above regional interest. And that makes him a statesman that they can count on, that he's going to be the president of the entire Nigeria and not just the president of the Igbo extraction. And I said I was going to ask you this, uh, I think, quick one. You know, campaigns have hardly been about politics. I mean, policies or solutions in Nigeria. But we've seen serious discourses from aspirants. Many will traditionally say do not have a chance or have a slim chance. How do these brilliant positions and suggestions help an aspirant? Honestly, the truth of the matter is that with what, you know, I always tell people, don't really judge politicians merely by what they, have, what they say. You know, I mean, anyone can meet any consultant to draft a manifestos and the best read it out. You are going to build reputation based on what we've done the entire past, based on your track record, based on your capacity. And I can tell you, there are two persons that if they eventually emerge on these two platforms, Maybe in an APC, you have an Osi Banjo, and maybe in PDP, you have um, an OPTOB. We are sure that we have like the option of choosing between the gold and the silver, and Nigeria have a better chances than when you have like some presence, like maybe if you imagine maybe uh, someone like uh, 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 what's the name of the Koki State Governor, that's Yayabelu. Imagine on APC, and then maybe you judge that with uh, maybe an article on the platform, or a week on the platform of PDP, uh, that would be like a, a choosing between, a, <laughs> a, permit me to say maybe, the, 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 you know, <laughs> the, you know. The, I won't, I won't push you, I won't push you to say it. Yes, yes, yes. I won't push you to say it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, so, so. <laughs> so that is it, but. But if we are left with the option of an Osi Banjo and, and, and P2B, I'm sure Nigeria, Nigeria will be choosing between two credible options, people who have had the experience, who, who saw times that Mr. President... Let me, let me, let me cut you there. Uh, apologies for butting in. Let me quickly bring in Kuno. We are okay. almost out of time. And I said I was going to bring this, uh, you know, uh, Atiku Abubakar, former Nigeria's vice president, yes. is still very much there. And uh, he's saying, well, perhaps uh, he should be given the right of first refusal. Well, I, I don't think that inconsistency of political character has magnetic attraction for people who are keen observers of the political processes. Um, whilst President Mahmoud Buhari was not with the All Progressive Congress, we saw consistency of pursuit, consistency of character with the parties he led, CPC, then, you know, so that is one part. Um, Atiku Abubakar has not demonstrated that stable character in terms of political affiliation to the extent that you've either turned the umbrella at some point or broken the broom at another time. It becomes difficult for people to see you as somebody that can be relied upon. And, you know, my friend was talking about PDP being in two states. I think PDP is still in one state because uh, Dave Umayi, as we call him, is the pretender who appears to be the only person and maybe few members of his cabinet in the APC. Every other person by heart are still in the PDP. So basically, Atiku doesn't come across as somebody that you can really, really give that weight of responsibility. We know he's got clout in this country. But do not forget, the chunk of the population are people whose ideas have moved away from inconsistency of political character to what we want and respect for our rights to be heard. If President Mahmoud Buhari were to go for another time in 2023, he would flatly lose, terribly, because how he has managed the goodwill of the people appears unsavory. So we're talking about an article who really needs to rethink, and that is even why the PDP has not made the article an item, even in the discussion of consensus candidacy, as it is in the present time. Well, that's a fine place uh, for us, uh, gentlemen, to say many thanks for being such nice company. Chukuma Okanwa and Adini Kunu, uh, you also kind thanks for your time. And uh, to all our viewers across the continent, many thanks for watching. We'll keep on uh, our tabs on the developments uh, in Nigeria and other parts of the continent, specifically as Nigeria prepares for this election. I'm Sulaiman. See you again.